My name is Linda Spurlock. I work here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and I'm the Director of Human Health. Right now we're sitting in the main osteology lab of the Physical Anthropology Department here at the Natural History Museum. The many specimens are the mecca for many researchers that come from all over the world. And this would be the Hammond Todd Osteological Collection, the biggest of its kind in the world. As an anthropologist, I studied a lot of osteology. And then as a graduate student, I learned human gross anatomy. I'm not formally trained as an artist, but I've taken facial reconstruction art workshops, both in two-dimensional sketching and three-dimensional sculpting. A few years ago, we had an exhibit here called Making Faces, and it was about the science and art of forensic facial reconstruction. So I did a step-by-step -step sculpture based on a plastic skull, perfect, perfect copy of a real human that eventually I got to see a photograph of this person. If you're working on a very fragile skull, well, you don't want to heap five pounds of clay on something like that. So then you would definitely prepare it the same way you would for 3D, but then photograph it and do a 2D sketch. What a facial reconstruction can help with is narrowing the possibilities of who this unidentified person might be. We know from the biological anthropologists that it's human. We know whether or not it's male or female, approximately how old, and we also know things about ethnicity. And then what the sketch does is narrows this big field even smaller. This is what this person's facial proportions looked like. And that can often trigger recognition in loved ones and family. In 1994, I was called upon to do a forensic sketch for the Portage County Sheriff in Ohio. And that very same year, a teenage girl in Rochester, Pennsylvania went missing. Years later, the police officer who was working that case noticed a strong resemblance between the sketch and what she knew the missing girl looked like. So that was enough to then get a DNA sample from both the girl's family and the bones that were still in the Portage County. And there was a perfect match. First thing we do when we're getting ready to reconstruct a face on an unidentified person is to glue the lower jaw into its anatomical position. Then we take certain measurements. The height of the mouth based on features of the teeth and how broad that nasal aperture is. And also in profile, this spine here that sticks out, we want to measure its projection. And then you glue what are called tissue depth markers on certain landmarks. These are pieces of mechanical erasers that you cut to certain standards. And this will tell me how far out the skin went then you would need a very high quality, undistorted photograph of this prepared skull. And then you would get the photograph printed exactly at life size. Then you would mount your photograph on a nice piece of Bristol board and put tracing vellum over it. And then you're ready to get out your pencils and your erasers. So this is not a high tech thing. You basically look at the tissue depth markers that you can see sticking out and connect them to make the shape of the face. And then you're ready to put in your features. Usually start with the eyes. And then there are standards for how much broader the nose is than that hole in the skull. So make little marks on either side to say, okay, this is how widely the nostrils are gonna flare. You have uh, guidelines about how thick the lips will be. But the, the shading that you do when you're sketching really starts to make it look much more realistic, much more human. If you're lucky, when you get the skull, you'll still have a little bit of hair sample included with it. And even if you just have one hair, you're going to know color, texture, and characteristic length. If you don't have that, you're going to have to guess. So now we have the finished sketch. Now this might look exactly like him, but that wouldn't be a positive ID. A positive ID is based on things like DNA, or fingerprints, medical hardware, tooth restorations, even just the shape of a tooth root. Those will be a positive ID in court. So my sketch or sculpture would lead to then gathering more information 
from the dentist or from the DNA lab or from the orthopedic surgeon. Part of this I find the most satisfying is getting to use my scientific background and my knowledge of anatomy with my artistic ability and being able to blend them. So it's a joy to me to be able to create these likenesses and be confident that they're pretty close to how the person really did look. If the crime is fairly recent, then these are about 75% effective, but I would say it's less effective if you're working on a very cold case. Recently, I was contacted by the Summit County Coroner to attempt a facial reconstruction sketch, and that was done, and it's been posted on several missing persons sites. Now, this is typical of many of the cases I get, where the person might have been missing for years or even decades. And we, um, we hope to solve this because it's a young person, someone out there must remember him. Having an idea who this person might be is the very first step in solving a crime. Because if we don't know who the victim is, it's almost certain that the murderer is walking free.